everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining me in the studio today are two panelists that you will definitely recognize. We've got Karen and Ella in the house today. So uh, quickly before we get started, happy spring. Thank you. Officially, Thank you. yay. Um, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about you. Karen, we'll start with you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Ruckel, and I live in the Peoria area, and I'm a horticulturist, and I like uh, perennials, annuals, houseplants. Okay. Ella? Um, I'm Ella Maxwell. I'm a master gardener and a horticulturist, and I'm working part-time now that spring is here at the nursery, and um, I enjoy trees and shrubs, perennials, all kinds of different things, so... Back um, at the nursery, huh? Yep. Does it feel good? To oh, take yeah. that big, that first big whiff and all that oh, earthy smell. It, it's wonderful to see all the new products, yes. to see the new plant material coming in, and um, and then to see some of my favorite customers yes. coming back. Every year to get their, their faves. Yep. Okay. Well, you guys brought a lot of stuff in to share, so let's jump in. Uh, Karen, we'll start with you, and you just start wherever you'd like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I'll see, you know, when you, when you talk just about spring and I brought in my poinsettia, I thought, you know, the poinsettia visited us last fall mm -hmm. or last, um, what, November, I think, when we were here. And I talked about that. And so this is, this is, yeah, you still can have your plant if you do that consistent watering. So I just brought him as a funny. It's still looking good, too. Now, will you put this out in the summer or will this remain a house plant? What's the future for this guy? Oh, the future does not look too swell for this. <laughs> um, it'll be composted. Oh, okay. All right. Well, well thank now, you, my friend. Do you think that you could just really just take the this brack stem out and then just let it bush out? Happy you spring, just bought Ella. A new plant. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, we'll see how it turns out. Okay. We'll bring it back for another update. All right. Oh, it looks pressure though. for you. Oh, oh, now I have to keep it alive. Yeah, you have to keep it alive. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Ella now. Let's uh, oh, okay. show us something. All right. Well, I um, brought. What am I doing in the garden? And so uh, here's a big stalk of of uh, ornamental grasses. <laughs> And it's very brittle now. Everything, it's breaking up. And uh, the ornamental grasses that we have in our gardens are, there's two types. Warm season grass, which means that it starts growing once the um, soil temperatures and night temperatures are consistently warm. And that would be this miscanthus, um, uh, this fountain grass. And then there's cool season grasses like the Carl Forrester grass. Um, so any time in February is pretty much when I'm thinking about cutting them back because they're starting to break up, the snow is laid on them and everything. And um, so if you haven't cut your grasses back, now is a great time to do it. And I do it with this little handheld, this is a Black & Decker. It has a removable, um, so you can put a drill on it. It's a 12 volt little battery charger thing. But um, the grasses are, um, uh, <laughs> are kind of tough. Mm -hmm. And just to do hand pruners, yes. it's, and this just makes quick um, work of it. Especially if you've got a mature clump. Big clump, yes, right. Yes. Well, and I even try to make it a little more tidy. If the, 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 if the clump hasn't fallen apart too much, I take some twine. Right. Ah, because right. I can compost and I, I bundle it up and then I go buzzing around. Mm -hmm. But I noticed when I was walking my dog yesterday that the Carl Forrester grasses, they've got growth up about seven to eight inches. Right. And that's the cool season grass. And so those grasses really need to be cut back right away otherwise it's very difficult you get the green mm -hmm. with the, the brown. Uh, brown together so these are easy to cut back now and again um, uh, chopped up composted mm -hmm. hauled off burnt whatever you know you want to do with it but uh, so it's okay to yeah. cut those to the ground right yes the, the okay. warm season the warm but, season but the cool season have already started sprouting so you're really going to delay Got that it. so right. you you really have to look where there's some green coming up and trim to that. Got it. Okay. Now. So pay attention to which type of grass you have. Um, also, I wanted to ask: Is now then a good time to divide your grasses, or do you need to wait a little bit longer? No, I think um, going ahead. They're very difficult to try to dig up. 
you need a, a, a sturdy, and, and I think we've shown some of mm -hmm. those different shovels that have the, um, the, the little... Um, like a point, like a... Right, and, and then also serrated on them too to try to take that clump out and then certainly it can be um, moved around. Is there anything else while we're talking about just sort of cleaning up? Um, I know it's early, spring has just sprung, but is it time to rake up those leaves? Is it time to tidy up those beds or is it still just a little bit too early in the season for that? And what do you guys do? Well, uh, you, you see, I see all the time is that they're saying leave all of that garden material on the garden because of the, the butterflies and other insects that are overwintering mm -hmm. in that leaf matter to leave it there. Um, I live in a community that has limited um, landscape pickup and I don't have a compost pile because it's just not me. And um, so I've cleaned up because our first pickup is the beginning of April. And so ah. if I don't get that picked up, I'm storing all that stuff then sometimes into May if I can't get it to gotcha. the drop off part. Gotcha. So, and then I've also noticed that I had some pulmonaria that had sprouted in some deep leaves and they were pretty yellowed. So if I hadn't pulled that off, oh, you know, gotcha. they just they just wouldn't have been happy. What right. about you, Ella? Um, I am not removing my leaves yet because of the pollinators and the overwintering uh, chrysalises. And that's an, and you can start doing that after the night temperatures are uh, moderating at about 50 degrees. And so the next two weeks we're still in the the 30s mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that, like I said, cutting back the ornamental grasses, I don't think that there's any reason not to mm -hmm. do that because I don't think there's a lot of pollinators doing anything there. And then I also cut back the foliage on um, my hellebores because I want to enjoy the flower that is already up about six, mm -hmm. eight inches. Mm -hmm. So I've removed that foliage and composted it. And then um, we had, let me try to think, Shane, I think it was Shane or Rusty talked about um, cutting the stems of old cone flowers and things like that. Like that's okay to clean up, but just leaving the leaf matter. Well, actually those stems of cone flowers, you wanna Could. cut back at maybe eight, yes. eight inches or something because they have a, a, a pith, a hollow mm -hmm. uh, pith that solitary bees could nest in because they're twig dwellers. Um, so the prairie type plant material, I don't even mess with okay. anything for a while yet. Okay, I like and, that. And then actually I do kind of rake along the edge of my bed because mm -hmm. that's where I have a lot of my spring bulbs. And like Karen said, you know, there are some plants that maybe are kind of yellow because they're been you know underneath all that. underneath mm -hmm. but again um, all those leaves that I rake off go over on something else somewhere I I don't want to um, send them to landscape waste because I have a large enough piece of property <laughs> to be able to um, absorb those um, materials great well and like for me my garden I have not I've not removed mulch from stuff that, that's tender. Mm -hmm. So every everything that I'm leaving around, I'm just chopping off anything that's dead, broken, mm -hmm. the leaves that have blown in through the winter months, cleaning that tidy. up. Yeah. I like that though. I like the dichotomy of your answers, you know? Uh, leave it or just do just a little bit, you know? And I feel like a lot of people at home are in that same position of, if I don't get rid of this now, I'm gonna have to hang on to it for a few months. So I like that. It gives people um, choices and, sure. you know, Real life. Okay, what's next? Um, well, I wanted to say uh, yeah, I'm so excited. In about 30 to 40 days, we could have our ha first hummingbirds coming back into the area. And when you look at the maps, they're they're moving up from the down south. Although there's there's a quite discrepancy of a couple different maps for where they're moving. But right now, they could be about 480 miles away. So I'm so excited. But thinking about hummingbirds. Um, for me in my yard, I just, it's always a treat every year as they migrate through, I get visited by Baltimore Orioles. And um, I've got, I, I know some people that, that they see them through the whole season, but for my area, I just have them migrate through. So it's like mm -hmm. a, a week or two of this funness of all of a sudden they're there and then they eventually move out. So um, 
I'm looking at trying to bring them to my house a little closer so I can get to watch them. Um, there's pictures somewhere on a jump drive at my house, but can't find them. But um, <laughs> there are commercial Oreo feeders. I stupidly bought one of these. I have never had one of them go to it, but but they're so, so shortly at my yard. Um, they will feed a little bit of nectar from my hummingbird feeders. And then, you know, since they're so heavy, they hang off of them, they, they drain out a lot. So I saw a project on the internet for making a homemade one. Oops. And I thought, well, I better do it now because if I don't do it, there, it's such a short period. So what this is, is it's a um, recycling, what you love. My love. Um, reusing. <laughs> um, it's an orange juice uh, container that I've um, put a little hanger, cut out a window so that then the um, Oriole can get at, they love fruit and sweetness, um, they can get at the orange, and then um, I could put a dab of um, grape jelly, that's another thing they really like, um, for helping to attract, to get to just mm -hmm. see them for the short time they are. I typically will just do a little saucer on my um, porch, um, because they'll come up on there and feed on the grape jelly. And um, the thing is, you have to be pretty proactive. It's a little warmer. Um, you know, these things will spoil quickly. So mm -hmm. it's every couple days, switching out, cleaning, um, so that, that you're not having uh, bacteria grow. And then also with the grape jelly, you just you don't want any uh, weird sweeteners, just regular old corn syrup and um, sugar uh, with that. Uh, but I just thought this was so cute, this little homemade one, because it's orange and orange thing. Right. That's a fun And you project. used a screw, just a single screw. It's, what, about three inches, maybe, that you went up through the, the little uh, stick and then into the bottom, and then that way you can put the orange on it. I, I think that's so clever. It is. And show them how you did the little loop oh. in the top, too, because people want to know how that happens. Well, I, I drilled a hole, and um, then I just used a zip tie um, for the top because it was stuff I had around the house. I had mm -hmm. a twig. Um, I, I did have to buy the orange juice because I don't drink orange juice, so I had to, I had to get the orange juice. Um, but just such, now I'm, I'm ready for when they come through. And in my yard, uh, typically, I see them when my red oak tree is completely leafed out. Oh, that's and all a good this, indicator. all of a sudden, I'll start hearing this kind of musical little tweeting out there, and I'm like, "Oh, get the jelly! <gasps> I think, I think they're here!" <laughs> and yeah, I'll hear them before I ever see them, and mm -hmm. then a day or two later, I'll finally be able to spot one. So that that's awesome. my just little one to two week excitement. Excellent. Uh, Jim Appleby did an experiment. Um, I think he said that they prefer the off-brand jelly. He tried like Smuckers and oh. Welch's and he said that they didn't care for the high-end stuff. They wanted just like the whatever you could find. So nice. You know, just grab any kind that you can find on the shelf and see. But make sure you said there's no sweeteners. Well, you don't want artificial sweeteners, just Got regular it. old corn syrup, sugar. Um, and then like I said, it's it's my my maple trees fully leafed out usually that later May, so it's it's still a long way out. But at least now I've got my little homemade project ready to go. And now, what about the hummingbirds? What's their schedule? Um, I document that every year, All and right. I in my in my yard I usually see them a little later than than you guys over here in Champaign Urbana. Um, but I consistently will have a few birds that always come to my yard, and that's going to be anywhere from the end of April to the first week of May. Okay. Is when I typically that gives see us them. a nice window to, to look for. Um, and then any type of hygiene or tips, questions about feeders that you guys want to mention. Um, do you? I know you're supposed to rinse them, but anything else that you want to tell folks that maybe want to get into birding or watching or feeding? Well, like the, the Baltimore Orioles, they like a lot of fruit, and you could plant shrubs and trees that produce fruit. But the thing is, if you're not in an area where they stay, mm. you're you're not really going to benefit from that. The hummingbirds, of course, go to a lot of tubular shaped flowers mm -hmm. so that they're easier to kind of entice into your yard. Gotcha. Gotcha. Anything to add on that, Ella? Uh, no, I don't see the hummingbirds as much because I have more tree cover. It's more foresty like. And again, same way with like monarchs and, and some of the butterflies. I don't really see them as much mm. because I've got a lot of tree cover, but out where Karen lives, you know, there's um, a lot more openness and lots of different houses and such, and they're, um, they're, they're there. 
Yeah. I, uh, we get hummingbirds quite a bit at the house and they always tend to gravitate toward, I don't have feeders out, which I might do that this year. They like my um, honeysuckle and the, the clematis. They visit those two and nice. that's it. Wow. Yeah, they just kind well, of buzz around them and then take off. I have a friend who's really into it. And again, he lives in a more suburban uh, subdivision area and um, he has multiple feeders and he also puts out cotton, um, uh, cattail plumes because they come and peck at it and they use that fluff in nest building. Oh. And then he also tries to find a old um, uh, limb or something that has lichens on it mm -hmm. because they also use lichens for nest Interesting. building. And so he can usually have a female nesting somewhere quite near him mm -hmm. and um, He's, he sees them daily and will sit outside and watch them, but I, I don't really see them that often, but I don't feed them either. Mm -hmm. Feeding is the best way to get hummingbirds with a feeder. With a I just know feeder. I won't keep up with it. There's just, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. a lot. That's a, that's a whole job, so. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, I see you've got some, are those bulbs? Yes, I there? do. Um, I uh, uh, brought dahlias. And so right now in the marketplace, you're seeing these um, overwintered tubers um, here in packages. And you wanna buy them now uh, because they can begin to sprout. And once they're starting to sprout, I don't know that they're, that good, but here you can get two bulbs and the flowers are just spectacular. And so um, this is actually what I've overwintered. So for me, um, I don't store them in any sawdust. I don't store them, um, I put them in a cardboard box. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's a nice that's a there. good. Yeah. So <laughs> I teamwork. dig them up in the fall <laughs> after the frost has kind of taken down and I um, I leave the the stem here and I just shake the dirt off, but these are actually all planted in the ground. So dahlias can be grown in a container or they could be grown in the ground. And so um I have found that they store best at a warm temperature. So I have my cannas and things down in the basement back room. It's, it can be 50 degrees, it can be kind of chilly. But these, again, I put them in a single layer in a cardboard box and then just slide that into a paper sack and I store them in an upstairs closet mm. because, you know, in more of 68 degrees instead of 50 degrees. And they they don't seem to dry out. The tubers are still real good. And the way that, because I'm planting them in the ground, this is what I think is a good way to do it. So again, after the temperatures are above 50 degrees at night, so probably not until mid-April, I will take a tray, plastic tray, and I'll line it with newspaper, and I'll put some potting soil on the bottom, and then I have like eight or 10 different dahlias, and I'll just fill the bottom of the tray with the dahlias, like I've got them stored in the cardboard box, and then I put soil over the top, and I sprout them, that way, instead of potting each individual one up or going and planting each individual one in the ground, I pre-sprout them. And you can do that with cannas. Mm -hmm. um, you can do that with any of your summer bulbs. And then I just, they, they send up shoots and I sent in a picture that uh, we'll be able to see. And then once they're growing, so about mid-May then, I just gently take each one out and then plant it into the garden, into the spots where I want them so to don't, be. So you don't plant that in a clump. You were gonna pop those off. In no, the... no, it's, this whole thing is planted. Okay, that whole thing. But it's thing. sprouted, but there's also in this container, large container, like 10 different varieties. Gotcha. That all I've, snug together. All gotcha. snug okay. together. And that way I only have to water one, one tray 
and then I can just put them in the wheelbarrow and take them out and you know dig a hole and, and they're already growing mm -hmm. and and they're you know ahead of the game so you can enjoy them sooner right right and that's what I would do with any of these that you would buy again too is like I would plant these all together mm -hmm. and and have them labeled and then you know you can set them out after you know they're sprouting and growing and doing well. Excellent, great and advice. And it's real important that you have this stem attached because these are just like little uh, storage um, uh, places for, for food and things, but if you would break one of these off, you can't really grow a dahlia from it. It has to have this stem tissue um, attached. Noted, okay, great advice, thank you. Um, I've got a question from Anna Jo Mounts. This is about beetles, and I know you guys have a, a beetle bet every year. Uh, gearing up for what is becoming an annual battle with the Japanese beetles, now they've discovered my white birch. I had a service treat the yard for grubs last fall, but I will not be using them again. What steps should I take this spring, and how do I determine the timing uh, for any recommended treatments? And they also love my lilies. So. Oh. What are your thoughts on helping with her birch and her lilies with Japanese beetles? Well, I, I hope for her the same thing that's happened for Ella and I, that we have seen a decrease in the amount of Japanese beetles and the damage that we're getting in her yards mm. um, over the years. So I, I hope that comes for her. But, um, I, you know, treating the yard with chemicals for the, the grubs, unless you're getting damage to your turf that's injurious, yeah, you'd, you'd have to have the whole community you live in treat your soil to impact the Japanese beetles because you're, you're just, the, the beetles that might emerge from your yard aren't all that come to feed on your yard. They're, they're coming from afar. Um, so your, your money spent or your pesticide use might be more used, to, best used for targeting that. Um, with her birch, she can try some of the systemic insecticides if, if she's okay to using those or the application is, is all right. Um, I've always had a good um, good result with um, using a permethrin spray um, on my birch tree when I've needed to. Um, now I've, I've gotten a little bit of less damage that I've, I've actually not sprayed in the last two years. Oh, okay. Um, because they, it, it, they, they haven't eaten down the trees, mm -hmm. so I haven't had that many. Okay. Um, and typically, Ella and I were talking about, we, we normally start seeing them around that Father's Day period that they'll start emerging. Right. So if you're going to do a systemic to protect the plant, you'd be wanting to get that on in the beginning of May because a large tree, it might take a good 30 days yeah. to get enough Almost of that chemical wow. up into the tree so that then you'll have the chemical into the leaves where the, the Japanese beetles would be feeding. Okay. Right. Anything and and there? it's it's real important to if she's going to treat, you treat when you first see the beetles because if you can remove that a spray, first, a topical spray. Yeah, a topical spray, uh, contact contact spray, the pi pi or pi permethrin, or any of those mm -hmm. types of um, knockdowns, um, they they'll kill them immediately, drop and and uh, die. Um, but uh, you want to spray early in the infestation because um, it's kind of like a smorgasbord. And the minute that they start feeding, they're going to release pheromones that just keep attracting more and wow. more and more beetles. So if you can shut down that first time that they're feeding, hopefully the rest of them just fly right over and don't realize that here's a good spot. Okay, okay. We've got about two and a half minutes left. Anything else that you guys want to show off or show and tell? So we, did we cover all those? Well, I just, I wanted to, you know, we talk of, Ella and I always talk and we were like, you know, we, we're not doing a lot of gardening stuff. And so what we fill our time with is we took a cookie decorating class at the <laughs> library. <laughs> so that's just some of the fun we nice. tried to do. And, and you know, we did flowers and there was actually a, a a woman, a young girl at the uh, class, she drew a uh, praying mantis. I don't know oh. how she accomplished that with uh, the icing, icing on her egg. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, wow. cookie. So yeah. um, Well, there you the, have it, gardeners. There are <laughs> other things you can do to occupy your time uh, while you're waiting. I forgot one question. This is from Gloria. Um, she wants to know about getting rid of poison hemlock. So she wants to get rid of it in the rosette stage. But the other question is, will treating it um, affect putting vegetables in that spot later this season? Right, and, and we uh, have kind of decided that she could go ahead and treat that rosette with Roundup, and what she could even do is um, use a, um, like a, because it's in the rosette and it's, it's right on the ground's surface, rather than s just spot spraying that, um, well, you would spot spray, but she could take like a dandelion weeder and pop that and mm. spray just that cut end with, a concentrated roundup and then um, she could then come back in and plant vegetables but if you're going to use some of the other different types of stump killers there are other chemicals that will have residuals and they would not be recommended but uh, she might be able to just dig it out physically remove the plant rather than to having to have to treat it with a herbicide. Gotcha, okay. Ladies, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. It goes fast, it goes fast, but lots of great information. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for watching. If you have questions for the team, please send them in to us at yourgarden at gmail.com or you can always search for us on, Mid search for Mid American Gardener on Facebook. You can find us there and send us a question and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching, good night. <laughs>